。尊敬的各位参会嘉宾，大家好，我是中央结算公司中债研发中心的史一，很高兴在此与 CBI 和兴业研究共同发布《2022年中国可持续债券市场报告》。这是我们与 CBI 合作的第四七份市场年度报告，也是我们首次在一份报告中。把视野扩展到绿色债券以外的社会责任及转型债券等领域，全面反映中国债券市场为可持续发展所做的贡献。在合作的七个年头里，我们有幸参与了市场从零起步到发展壮大的整个历程，也见证了可持续发展理念在中国债券市场全面落地生根。我们在记录历史的同时，也在书写历史。中央结算公司与大国债市相伴成长。持续拓展金融技术设施，服务绿色发展的广度和深度，在绿色债券全生命周期服务、绿色担保品管理、ESG 评价体系、绿债特色研究等方面多点突破，全方位助力绿色债券市场高质量发展。为促进绿色金融标准化建设，公司正式发布了中债绿色债券环境效益信息披露指标体系企业标准。并持续推动指标体系在金融行业标准和地方标准的应用落地，同时建成国际领先的绿色债券环境效益信息数据库，促进绿债环境效益信息行业共享。转型债券市场发展同样需要高质量的环境效益信息披露。G20 转型金融框架的发布，促进了国际共识，明确了全球转型金融的发展方向。中国为此做出了重要贡献。在此基础上，加强中国转型债券信息披露体系建设，既有利于推动中国转型债券市场规范化、标准化发展，也为全球转型债券市场建设提供中国方案，贡献中国智慧。我们也将充分发挥金融基础设施的作用，持续研究完善绿色及转型债券环境效益信息披露标准，更好地支持可持续发展领域的全球协同。谢谢大家。We wouldn't be able to do this reporting, this tracking, this understanding the China green bond market in the lens of these national markets without the help of our partners in China. Critically important. We this is a this is a project together. But of course, the big project together is how we achieve transition. How we what happens next? What the next year, the next couple of years look like? For that, I have some friends. To share these ideas with you, first I want to welcome Manchu Deng, who's the deputy head of China and the head of research. Because in a moment she's going to give a couple of key points from the China report. Come and join us on the stage, Manchu. And she lives in Hong Kong, folks. If you want to have a closer connection, please grab her in the drinks afterwards and、uh, explore how we might work together. Gabriel Yu, who's the director of fixed income and a portfolio manager at Ping An Asset Management, Hong Kong. You will appreciate that Ping An is the world's largest insurer. Now he's working in a small corner, but it's a huge organisation, and we're proud to say that our climate bonds partner, Leslie Mazdorp, who's the vice president, CFO of the New Development Bank, also known as the BRICS Bank, and has been there since tw- to 2015, so quite a while. He's got a history in private markets,、uh, managing director of Bank of America South Africa. But he's also got a history in the liberation movement in South Africa. So if you want to get him going afterwards, offer a beer to tell, tell him about, get him to tell you about his experiences. It's a it's a fantastic history that he's had. Tracy Wong Harris, whoa, what can I say? A dynamo. She is the managing director, head of sustainable finance Asia for Standard Chartered, and of course, the person who's engineered the sponsorship of this event and the report. They're about to hear a little bit about、uh, Anna. We're proud to say Standard Chartered is one of our climate bonds partners. And then, lastly, today to talk about what's going to happen next, Shoni Wang, Managing Director,、uh, Head of Sustainable Capital Markets for APAC, but most importantly, Vice President and Secretary General of the Hong Kong Green Finance Association. And that's the hat she's wearing today. She's going to give us the big picture to wrap up. Please take a seat. Manchu, give us a couple of highlights of this report. What do people need to know? First of all, let me say it was hard work load, work of load、um, for China 
So people globally, the volume has shrank last year, right? But for China and Hong Kong, we have seen growth. China produced the largest volume of green bonds last year. And then by green bonds here, it's based on our database. The specialty about what's about our database is screened. Uh, we screen over 80 jurisdictions, different markets, using the same standard, looking at different labeled uh, markets, including green, social sustainability. We also track transition and SLB as well. So for example, the China report, as you just said, uh, have seen in the video, they've already highlighted the high volume in, in green bonds. But we'll also see there is a quality growth as well in terms of improvement of quality. For example, in, in, the, in the report, I'll highlight the user proceeds that's questioned by the, for, on the Chinese labeled market is that with the Chinese uh, green bond principle coming into play, that we have seen a significant improvement of this 100% user proceeds going into green project. So there, there you will see a bit more detail in the uh, report. And also switching to the Hong Kong side, um, Hong Kong is a very special, so we have a, we produced a special report for, uh, for Hong Kong region. And the specialty for Hong Kong, it, it's got its own uh, climate agenda. And it also serves as a, a financing platform for nearby countries and regions. And we have seen, according to HKMA's data methodology, there is over 40% of growth in terms of, SL, uh, in terms of green and sustainable loans and also bonds, especially in the loans, it's almost doubled. So these are all exciting, using data supporting what has been just said in the previous panels. There is a lot of excitement going on and we have certainly to be seeing more. So that's it. These reports are available free online on our website to download and to share as you wish. And if you want to get a presentation for your institution, if you're a fund manager or a bank, talk to Manchu and we'll see what we can organize. Um, it's Second. very important we share the data. Of course, there are some differences. There have been some differences, as Manchu was alerting to, between the China definitions, the work of different regulators, and international. The key point is this is changing very quickly now. And so the harmonization, perhaps supported by the Common Ground Taxonomy as well, is well and truly underway. But, of course, what does it work, how does it work for a fund manager? So let's ask Gabriel what's happening. He uses the data, by the way, but how do you see appetite for these instruments growing? What's actually going on on the, um, the buy side? Sure. Uh, so uh, on our side, uh, I, maybe I sp speak on behalf of, firstly, the Ping An Group company, as well as uh, ourselves on a fund level. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of uh, interest in the green bond space. And I think it's both uh, push factors and pull factors. So for the push factors, we're seeing, firstly, uh, Ping An Group is one of the largest insurance companies in China. Uh, so due to that, we have very strong incentives uh, to be aligned with the national interest. And as we all know, China has a very strong incentive uh, towards uh, uh, peak carbon neutrality and uh, peak carbon goal 20, 2030 and 2060. So at Ping An Group, we also have a similar goal to reach uh, operational uh, carbon neutrality by 2030. Uh, and that's quite aligned with national interests. And that's also one of the things that are prompting us to look more into ESG financing. Uh, and uh, alongside with that, uh, we're also, uh, at the Ping An Group, we also had a couple of new policies initiatives uh, to uh, decrease the amount of uh, carbon intensive industries. So for example, coal, steel, uh, non-first metals, and also uh, reduce that. And by uh, 2025, we also have goals to reduce our investments in coal mining. So that's a driving force within the entire organization to look into more transition financing and sustainable financing. Uh, and uh, at the fund level, uh, which is what I rep represent in Hong Kong, uh, is we're seeing a lot more investor demand these days. Uh, so it's, it's not just from uh, uh, a green angle. I think from an investment proposition, it also makes a lot of sense for us. Uh, so firstly, from the green side, I think uh, one of our panelists earlier mentioned uh, incentives. Uh, and uh, the re regulatory point of view, uh, incentives <laughs> have been providing us a very strong push to do uh, green investments. And I think one of the things, or one of the more important points is that it provides us more clarity uh, in terms of what the playing field is and uh, 
what kind of uniform guidelines that we can have from investors. So for example, uh, last year, the Hong Kong SFC uh, started to mandate uh, risk climate, dis uh, climate risk disclosures. Uh, so after that, I think there's a lot more clarity uh, for investors to understand what kind of data should be expected and from us, what we should expect to provide our investors. Uh, so that provides a framework uh, in terms of how we market our funds and how investors look at us. So after we have this, uh, uh, this guideline in place, I think it's easier for investors to understand uh, the kind of value proposition that we have. And uh, lastly, the point I mentioned on, the, on value. Uh, so one of the, the uh, when we look at fixed in income investments, uh, one of the earlier points that a lot of the market participants talked about was greenium. Uh, and I think uh, back, back two or three years ago, if you look at the greenium in the hard currency uh, green bond space, you'll see it, see it around 5, 10 basis points. Uh, so currently it has tightened this year, uh, but this year might be a little bit of ab abnormally given uh, that the rate environment has changed quite a bit. So you'll see the greenium shrink to around 3 to 4 basis points this year. Uh, but the presence of it still speaks volumes saying that there's still a lot, very strong technical demand uh, for a sustainable investing uh, in Hong Kong and Asia and globally. Uh, so I think these are some of the key things that we're looking for. So overall, I still see a very strong future uh, for green investing, and there's still a very strong demand uh, from our side. You heard that here, everyone. Very strong demand from their side. If you're a deal originator, hey, get out there and do it. <laughs> I want to ask a deal originator. <laughs> First, if I can ask you, Tra Tracy, to comment on what Gabriel said in terms of what you see as the likelihood of more deals coming through and meeting this interest on the part of uh, investors. How do you see the market? What's happening? Well, 100%. So first of all, I think we need to look at the, um, the funding gap, the opportunity side, right? So although that the market has grown tremendously over the last 10 years or so, um, hitting 1.7 trillion back in 2021, and, and but how much do we need to get to net zero globally? So last I learned from IEAs is 150 trillion US yep, dollar. That's right. And from, from that perspective, looking at Asia and EM markets, so we recently uh, published a pod, uh, report called Just In Time. So the report points out that we need 95 trillion US dollar um, for e EM to transition to net zero. And from there, um, I think the dynamics of having um, asset owner uh, managers coming into this place is if EM to fund it by themselves, actually their domestic consumptions uh, year on year will be worse off by about 5%, about 2 trillion per year, and from now to 2060. However, if we are able to have um, the development market, uh, private capital coming into place to fund the market, overall uh, the EM will improve by 3% and also globally um, improve, so it's a win-win situation. So that really highlights the role from you know from investor perspective, from banks perspective, why we need to be there to channel the capital, and the funding gap is still huge. So for that funding gap to be huge, and the demands has to be there. This is that's a wonderful segue uh, to a man who is trying to figure out how to channel capital from world capital markets to emerging markets here. And I still remember, Leslie, the day you told me of the credit rating you managed to get for you, you developed for the, the NDB, which was a, an amazing coup at the time. A classic story of bridging the need between emerging markets and richer capital markets. But what do you see is happening next? What's, what have we got to do now to make sure this transition works? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sean, and thanks for the invitation to, uh, to be here. I think we're living through a very exciting uh, transition within the development finance world uh, today uh, because the entire industry is looking at how can we become more effective, more uh, catalytic, if you like, and, and use our high credit worthiness. You made reference to our high credit rating. In fact, the development finance institutions, the development banks, are the highest rated financial institutions in the world. Uh, New Development Bank, have a AA plus international credit rating, and most of the others, World Bank, Asia Development Bank, Africa Development Bank, European Investment Bank, all AAA, the last remaining AAA institutions. The key task for us is to leverage and use that high credit worthiness to transport that benefit into the financial markets, meaning could we make better use of guarantees where instead of us lending, because we've got a defined balance sheet, if you look at the entire MDB community combined, the balance sheet maybe is about $2.5 trillion or so. It's very small relative to that $130 trillion you uh, mentioned. 
I think the, the development banks today have the best chance to become, if you like, real climate banks. Climate banks of uh, uh, today that are required to lead this transition. And I say that, Sean, because if you look at the last 20 years, MDBs played a very critical role in shaping the sustainable finance landscape from the Equator Principles 2003, they were adopted by the development banks first, to the, the green bond market, which started with MDBs in 2006, 2007, the World Bank and European Investment Bank issued the first green bonds. Today, it's north of $1.8 trillion market. Uh, the green bond principles, 2014, and so on. I can make many examples to demonstrate that MDBs will now, uh, now have the potential, rather, to come into their own, to play that role to be effective mobilizers of finance. So in other words, we are now decisively, in my view, moving away from our traditional model, which has been um, using our, or growing our balance sheet by lending, towards more using our balance sheet in such a way that we use all of our funding to leverage and, and to, to catalyze. So New Development Bank, for example, have a target now shown of 40% of all of our annual commitments goes towards climate, both climate mitigation, climate adaptation. Now, 40% sounds like a you know, very impressive number, but it's only 40% of you know, 5 billion, which is our annual volume. It's very small. So what we should do is use that 40% in such a way that we can crowd in 30, 50, 80 billion. And that's really the task at hand. So in terms of the next phase of um, uh, sustainable uh, finance, I think these institutions ought to redefine their mandates, and that is now happening. When I say redefine our mandates, the World Bank, which is the largest of the development finance institution, is currently revisiting a mandate that has been adopted decades ago. And they're incorporating the climate agenda as part of the vision statement. Now, that is very, very significant, Sean, because what it will do, it will change the entire culture, the incentives, the way people are assessed in every respect. It might seem like a small thing just to add the word climate into your mandate, but I think it will have a transformative uh, impact. So we're moving away from individual institutions, lending, doing sustainable finance projects, to mo be more catalytic, mobilizers, and changing and creating markets, which is the concept that is now increasingly being used. We want to be, um, in, in, we want to play a more transformational role in uh, sustainable finance. In terms of what's next, a number of new instruments have been uh, designed. There'll obviously be a more and more transitional, transition bonds, if you like, more and more uh, innovation in the sustainable financial instruments going forward. This is not a small thing. This is everything. We heard from Megumi earlier what Jack is doing. Across the major development banks and the MDBs, shifting from a small amount of leverage to large leverage would make a, would make a huge difference to the deals that land on Gabriel's desk at a risk yield that he can invest in without having to take high risk. It will give a lot more throughput for Tracy and Shawani. There are something like 597 development finance institutions around the world. About half a dozen do any kind of leverage along the lines of what Leslie's talking about. Imagine, imagine if we could get all of them to change their approach to be able to bring in private capital behind it. You can, and to take risk positions to make it easier for private investors to imagine the flow of capital. Now you can see how we could get to the 10 to 15 trillion a year that we need to be moving. We could do it if we could do all of these things as well. So it's a very hopeful message. I want to add a point on uh, to Leslie's point. So I think uh, last week, end of last week, IMF uh, visit Hong Kong co-hosted this meeting at HGMA. Yep. It's talking precisely that. And then traditional role from IMF is how to help the economy from the macro perspective. But what they're doing and shifting that con um, um, focus into climate is setting up a separate fund and then still land at sovereign level. But what can you do with that to tie to the climate? So what kind of a condition of the outcome from climate that they can incentivize and keep tracking from that country perspective, that outcome driven, you know, landing to the country level, that's incredible. I think that's um, very much in line with, uh, Leslie, what you suggested. And this is trend is coming. All the MDBs and, you know, IMF, they are looking at this space. IMF, World Bank, NDB, it's going to be crazy. I think it's going to be crazy, Shawnee. What do you think? What's the future hold? The future is exciting. <laughs> I think for sustainable finance, 
when I think about future, right, the next few years and decade to come, and, and obviously ultimately towards the net zero 2050, we really need to look at four things. Breadth, um, depth, scale, and speed in order for, to, yep. for us to achieve the ambition, right? For breadth, we look at our current sustainable financing uh, 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 options. It certainly has diversified uh, with more and more labels, so on and so forth, more and more participation. But I think we also need to look at some of the mega trends like transition. The, the reason why everyone in the room is talking about transition is because Asia is going through transition, yeah. right? So, and you have heard from the superstars earlier, including the regulator telling you that you shouldn't, and you shouldn't wait for the perfect taxonomy to come. There are already existing tools credible tools like the CBI standards, like the OECD framework and the G20 framework to give you a very good sense of how to structure transition financing instruments uh, and, and with, together with the public sector or the MDBs to drive to deliver this kind of transition capital for transition activities and transition planning. Right? So that's one of the sort of expansion of scope that we need to see in sustainable finance. If I count the number of transition bonds as a proxy in the market, I probably can count them with two of my fingers, uh, hands, right? They're just very little right now. So I think all with, you know, as we continue to progress, I would expect transition bonds, transition finance in general, would achieve the same market status and market share just like green bonds. And yes. we shouldn't look at transition bonds with the taboo that transition bonds are being associated with greenwashing. Obviously, we need to be very careful, diligent about the way we structure transition financing. But this shouldn't be a direct connotation to greenwashing because there's a clear need to support Asia's transition. And I hope everyone would agree with me on that. And you know, another example about the, the expansion of soil breadth is, is biodiversity, right? It's an emerging you know, issue. Uh, obviously, right now we, we are piloting it under the uh, TNFD framework. So we definitely, you know, uh, watch out uh, how this would affect disclosure and therefore reallocation of capital. Mm -hmm. uh, once we, we know how to measure, how to report, then the capital will flow in to support activities that would really protect, you know, biodiversity. And we have already seen some of those leading examples by some of the Chinese banks, like Bank of China, Industrial Bank, China Merchants Bank, came up to the market with a biodiversity uh, green bond, you know, with the proceed dedicated to support uh, conservation, restoration of the ecosystem, right? And blue bonds, right? You know, you have a lot of the MDBs uh, updating their green bond framework with mm -hmm. blue and biodiversity project to just, you know, give a couple of examples. Um, depth, and I think, you know, as Manshu mentioned, there's quality improvement, you know, in the China uh, green bond market. And that's something that we need to see across the board as well. It's not about how much you print, print uh, and, or you come to the first, you know, whatever, you know, thematic bond, right? It's about the quality. Let's really go back to the basis of your ESG fundamentals of credible ESG or decarbonization plan, approach, you know, disclosure, so on and so forth. Investors, you know, as they become more and more willing and more and more sophisticated needed that. Scale, you know, Tracy already mentioned, there's huge financial uh, uh, funding gap. As much as we love the market, you know, existing, you know, over almost three yeah. trillions now, it's a drop of the ocean. We're talking about just over 10% of the total debt capital market. It's not enough, right? So we need that kind of scale to, for us to deliver net zero and speed. You know, we, are not, we talked about it earlier. If you go back to the first green bond, that was 2007, for it to reach the $1 trillion mark in outstanding, it took us over 10 years to get there. Yep. But if you look at, you know, from the $1 trillion to the second one, uh, to, the, to the true trillion, it took us over two years. So the speed is scary in a way that's so exciting, right? So what is gonna happen in the next few years? I have no doubt that we will retreat, achieve you know, the next trillion in a very short space of time with the transition, biodiversity, social resilience. There are just so many things to watch out. So many things to do. 
and that upward change suggests an enormous amount of business to be done, which is all going to hit Gabrielle's desk, of course, as opportunities to invest. I want to go to the audience and see if you've got any questions and comments, and then we'll come back to the panel. So we've got a couple of mics floating around. We've got a, a question at the back. Just put your hand up so I can see where you are. Questions or comments? And Chris from Standard Chartered, I'm going to be asking you to stand up in a minute to make a comment. Be prepared. And there's someone here, also his hand up. Please, go ahead. Yeah, thank introduce, you, Sean. Introduce yourself. Yeah. Jose Luis Sanchez from ERM Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Fantastic panel. So my question is about a couple of things. Uh, in the previous panel, uh, Diana mentioned about blended finance as one of the mechanisms to fulfill this 95 trillion that you, Tracy, mentioned. Uh, however, I mean, what is the point of view of a bank, right? So it's pleasure in blended finance where you need to jump into deals with multinationals, development banks, as Leslie mentioned, and we're probably we're looking at projects that are not 100% bankable, and it's a little bit difficult for a bank to, to jump in terms of risk and, and return. So I think it's, it's key besides all the, the current mechanisms with bonds and loans. Okay, that'll be a question for a couple of you. Please, over here. Uh, in the, sorry, that man there, Put it, give him the mic. <coughs> Stand up. Hi there, uh, John Sayer from Deloitte. Um, a question to Leslie and possibly backed up by others. At, at the COP27 Sharm el Sheikh, um, the final statement talked about restructuring the global financial architecture. And the, uh, the emphasis was on the multinational, multilateral development banks. So the question is really, how's it going? And are the MDBs working together on a common agenda for restructuring the global financial architecture. Good question. Other questions, please? We've got one at the back here. Please stand up. Hi, I'm Neka Chikiobi from Sustainable Fitch. I have a question about transition bonds following what Chowney said. I'm wondering how you have ideas of how you can innovate this product to help investors dealing with the challenge of a use of proceeds format to finance um, emerging or new technology where the economic viability may not be proven. Um, innovations such as combining transition with a KPI-linked sustainability-linked format, for example. Just curious to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. One here. Please stand up. Thanks again for sharing your experience and wisdom. Um, I'm curious. When we started off today, we heard from Sean about the human aspects. He said about um, the situation with the climate. We don't want our grandchildren. We heard from Jaika about the social aspects. Do you feel whether there's a need to humanize a little bit more uh, with what you're doing? Uh, sort of transition and externalities and so on. Should we be saying in the same breath about number of workers being reskilled, amount of pollution being reduced in water and soil, number of communities living better? Thanks. Good question. Please. Uh, hi. Uh, Frank from uh, Bank of China. I uh, hear a lot of discussion about the speed uh, for, the, uh, for the market. Uh, obviously, one trillion uh, take so long is, is not normal in the capital markets. Uh, does it because all this market is, is so top-down driven uh, rather than a very bottom-up like a development? Because we all know in the, in the, in the normal circumstances in the capital markets, people will, the, uh, the private sector, they will find their way to develop, to make money and to bring the market to the next level. So maybe, you know, private sector sh should do more or asking for more like a policy set up. Thank you. Good question. Please. Uh, 你好,我就直接用中文问问题了。Thank you. And I would like Chris to stand up and just say a, uh, three things about the link between carbon markets and bond markets. Just to repeat the conversation we had and the sort of thing you're doing, just to throw in, please. From Standard Chartered. Need a mic just there. 
Hi, thanks, uh, thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, I, 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 I guess that uh, what uh, I'd like to see is uh, as much money going into into good product uh, projects that are going to reduce carbon emissions uh, around the world. And so, uh, what I'd like to see is support from the MDBs, support from the insurance sector, insur inf uh, support from banks who will be able to come in and. Um, provide provide uh, financing, but also to provide the wrappers that would allow us to get that money into into uh, projects that will actually ge generate carbon credits, and those credits can actually support the finance, and then they can actually support the uh, the green transition. So that's that's the area that I'd like to see that cooperation between those different parts of finance and the uh, financial infrastructure to really get money into projects that wouldn't get it otherwise at scale. So that's the area that I think we want to really um, see some um, developments on, and I'd really love to hear about that. Thank you. Innovation. Who would like to kick us off? I'll just start very briefly. Um, <laughs> firstly, those are very, very exciting uh, and a very comprehensive list of um, issues which uh, my panelists and I will, will try to address. Let me kick off with the um, broader macro question around the global financial uh, architecture. Let me start by saying that there's no question in my mind, and I've been on this view, uh, of this view for, for a very long time, that the current configuration of the uh, global financial governance is, is out, of, um, out of touch with the modern realities. The reality is that in 1944, which was the, you know, in the aftermath of the Second World War, as we all know, in the aftermath of the destruction of Europe, the IMF, the World Bank, and the, the current architecture actually comes from that era, literally 80 years uh, ago. The ownership and control structure, the governance, has pretty much remained the same despite very fundamental changes in, in the world. Over the last 45, the last 30 to 45 years, the most dramatic development has been the rise of China, the rise of India, and other large emerging uh, markets. When you look at the control structures of global institution, it still reflects the sort of imbalance, if you like, between the developed world and the uh, developing uh, world. So China's second biggest economy uh, in the world, an example, 18 point odd trillion dollar uh, economy. If you look at their ownership within the uh, global financial system, whether it be the IMF, the World Bank, does not represent the economic weight. And so is the case also for India and many other developing countries. However, and I can make a very, very uh, compelling case why the current structures are really out of touch and not fit for purpose. But there's very little appetite for a fundamental re-engineering of the system as it exists. So the best we can do is to incrementally sort of make changes and amendments and evolve, and that will result in a fundamental reset of the, the financial system as we, as we know it. Um, I would say one of the best um, sort of most recent summations of what needs to be done was done by a G20 task force that uh, came out in 2020, sorry, 2017, 2018, at the annual meetings in Bali. It was done by the former Minister of Finance of Singapore, Tarman. He led that eminent persons group report. And it's called uh, Making Finance Work for All. And in that report, they set out how to engineer a global financial system that is more geared towards the challenges of today and to reset the financial system to deal with the climate challenges and so on. So I would encourage you to read that report uh, uh, in particular. In short, I believe that there are fundamental changes underway today, not just in the public development finance institutions, but also in the private commercial institutions that will result in a, uh, a fundamentally new look for our uh, industry. When you open the annual report of uh, uh, BlackRock, which is you know, the biggest uh, uh, asset manager out there with over $9 trillion, it starts by saying you know, climate risk is investment risk. You'd never have seen that 15 years ago or even eight years uh, ago. But that is the modern thinking of asset managers and yep. institutions sitting here. There's an explicit recognition that we need to look very differently, as Jack and others have argued in the previous panel as well, in how we make investment decisions and, and, and factoring in uh, climate decisions in every aspect of uh, uh, investment. Um, on that first topic, I'm very passionate about, but I'll stop there and, and maybe just say something briefly about blended, blended finance, which was the first question that was asked. 
There is no question that blended finance needs to be scaled and needs to be scaled significantly. There's also no question also that development banks got a fundamental role to play. Why? Because we have the best, uh, we're most equipped in terms of the financial instruments. We have concessional finance, which is what the World Bank is called the IDA sort of a window. And in order to take the climate um, uh, um, finance arena to the next uh, phase, we need to increase significantly the available uh, concessional uh, finance. And I say that because when you look at the, this change that I referenced earlier on, where climate is now becoming center stage in the mandates of development uh, banks, what this will do paradoxically is impact negatively on some developing markets. And let me just uh, uh, say uh, a little bit more detail what I mean. I come from South Africa. The entire African continent the entire continent, more than a billion people, produce 3.8% of global carbon emissions. If we now direct concessional resources, and Africa is also the poorest continent in the world, if you look at 2030 projection of poverty numbers and how the demography of poverty is changing, the majority of the poor are no longer in, in Asia, Southeast Asia, China, India, and so on, they are in Africa. If we direct concessional finance away from countries like uh, you know, Madagascar, DRC, and other countries in Africa towards the climate agenda, we will be directing more resources towards where the biggest emitters are. <coughs> Who are the biggest emitters? China, 27% of global greenhouse gas uh, emissions, India, and, and so on. So it's very important as we redesign financial instruments, as we look at blended finance, that we take into account the point that many others made in the panels before us around just transition. We have to ensure that this transition has a just and equitable uh, component. Otherwise, we will creating new uh, um, sort of um, geographic pockets of, of imbalance in terms of, of income uh, distribution. Let me pause then give my other colleagues a chance to come in. I'm happy to uh, come in writing on the blended finance and I go to transition finance. So for the blended finance answering the question, yes, it's definitely not enough and it's slow because it takes time. I remember the first blue bond gone to the market took three years to bake and it's 20 million, no, no, right? <laughs> and I think like we can turn it around in like eight weeks with SPO. So, um, so it's a very different ball game, but we will see more. Because as we approach adaptation as well, we need both public and private sector crowd into the place. Um, Leslie mentioned just transition. So take two examples um, in, uh, in for Indonesia and for Vietnam. So the Jack P program, the Just Energy Transition Platform program, so 20 billion um, 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 MOU has been signed between 10 from public and 10 from private uh, company to go into decarbonized coal, but with a just uh, transitions uh, program. So these are all working. Um, in, you know, between public and private, MDB all crowded in addressing in Indonesia. A similar um, 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 program has been set up in Vietnam as well. So I would imagine this is need to happen and it will scale and it will be happening like more and more because of the way that we're approaching um, adaptations in that and biodiversity as well. And then going into back to transition bond on that, right? Uh, on the sustainability link structure. In fact, I am a big fan of sustainability link structure because it's so clear that you can tie your GHG emissions directly to a uh, payoff outcome. To, and it doesn't have to be just bonds. It can be bond, can be loan. So I typically, like one of the transactions, I think is um, on one of the airlines that you actually see both come in, a transition bond plus a sustainability link structure together uh, for helping the airline to decarbonize. So a combo of that. But Let's take it wider and take a step back, right? When we say transitions, it actually means very different thing to a lot of people here. When, when Chowning say transition finance, or when I say we actually, or Sean, we will be really looking at transition finance label. It's a very narrow, small label at the moment. But when you're talking about for an industry to trans trans transition, it actually take cut across the whole thematic from green to from green to rainbow all the way. And then in terms of the product, need to apply to it as well. Just take, um, I think you mean as, um, you mentioned SME and supply chain, right? Think about having sustainable trade offering as supply chain at SME level, that, decarb that will help M like multinational to decarbonize their scope free, right? So that product offering to think beyond just loans and bond and then to you know, sustainable trade, to ESG derivative, and all the way even to retail. 
is super important from, from large corporate, from financial institution, all the way to SME and all the way to retail product in Hong Kong. We already see retail green bond, we see green mortgages, we have sustainable deposit. So this development has to happen in order to really say transition to net zero. All this has to happen. Thematic product and different weight of financial instrument come in. Uh, I might just supplement a little bit. Um, it may be easier to narrow down the question to transition financing for the heart of the base sector, so because mm -hmm. I think that's really the, the barriers that we are facing as an industry, both for investors and for banks, originators, as well as you know, other third-party providers. Um, you know, the way I see it, perhaps you know, easier to just borrow from the G20 uh, uh, framework that Dr. Ma uh, uh, led, you know, there are four pillars that he talked about, right? The first one is really defining the, the text transition activities, could be the principle based like Japan, or the, the taxonomy based like, you know, some are being developed mm -hmm. by, by you guys at CBI. So that's one of the very fundamental components so that you can know where, you know, the user pro the proceeds raised would be funded, what exactly that would deliver a significant improvement uh, to, uh, uh, to decarbonize, you know, mm -hmm. pre uh, preferably in a science, uh, uh, scientific manner. But that itself is not sufficient because transition for any company, for any sector, is not just a, a, a static, you know, issue. It's not just looking at the current point in time over the next six months, what are you going to deploy in terms of capex? Transition requires time. So therefore, it's a dynamic process, and that's why where the transition strategy and action plan really kicks in, supported with transparency so that you can demonstrate to your key stakeholders like investors that you are in fact delivering your transition plan. So, so if you just look at these two core components, it's pretty much a hybrid of user pro C bond and a sustainability link bond. Mm -hmm. Because you need both for the credible transition story. You c it's not a trade-off of should I think about a user proceed transition bond for, for, for my still you know, uh, company uh, uh, right, uh, financing or a SLB. Because if you just do a SLB or SLL framework, you won't be able to answer the question, how are you going to deliver the tran transition, right? Because I'm deploying new CapEx, new OPEX, uh, changing my whole uh, uh, manufacturing capacity in order for me to transition. So there's a lot on this agenda. Uh, we've published certification criteria in uh, multiple sectors. And an example of how we're dealing with this thing, this is not a universal emissions reduction, scope through, etc. In the steel sector, electric arc furnaces, they qualify. Bringing in electricity is not so important. We're not asking for a calculation of emissions because we need a lot of electric arc furnaces. If it's a blast furnace that uses coal and gas, oh yeah, we need an emissions approach. And in fact, we need to push that toward DRI and hydrogen as quickly as possible uh, because of the transition pathway we have to achieve. If we shift from coal to gas, we're locking in 30 years of emissions. It becomes a stranded asset, and we know gas has now got a much higher emissions level than we thought. What we're doing at a taxonomy level, and this includes in the Hong Kong taxonomy, is making calls on what are the simplification of criteria for different sectors. So if you're a, a maker of triple glaze windows in a cold climate, you're just in. You don't need to do reporting. You qualify. If you're a maker of electric vehicles, you're just in. We do not require accounting from the electricity system because we've made a decision at a taxonomy design level that the transport sector has to change in parallel the electricity system, so we're not going to make it a dependency. So these are the features of taxonomy, simplifying it, making it easier for issuers and banks as we go forward. But do have a look, because the Hong Kong taxonomy is out for consultation. We've got to the 30th of the month to provide input and feedback. Please do have a look. It's a public document. So maybe I'll just add a point on the Please. transition bonds uh, from an investor perspective. I think just, just maybe, maybe not to be a party pooper, but I think it's going to, some, it's going to be something that's going to take a little bit of time. Because uh, traditionally, as an investor, we're used to seeing user proceeds bonds. So they're bonds with a qualifying asset. Uh, and uh, we mentioned sustainable link bonds, as well as transition bonds, or a hybrid of both, uh, which will be a different structure. 
Uh, and I think the difficulty for us is that uh, when we structure a product or a fund, uh, there, are, there are defined guidelines in terms of what we can invest in and what we cannot invest into. Like, so for, for example, for green bonds, we abide by the CBI taxonomy. Uh, and currently, I think recently we launched a, a CBI launched a transition taxonomy as well. Uh, so I think we, we do not have a very standardized like, version of what is defined as a transition uh, bond uh, right, right now in different jurisdictions. Even for green bonds, there's different, different uh, like understandings of what it is. Like in the EU, you have the EU taxonomy. Uh, internationally, we could use the CBI taxonomy, but there's like very, a little bit of nuances between the taxonomies. So for us, us as investors, it becomes very difficult to launch a product and say, uh, we can invest into green bonds as well as transition bonds. And then when investors ask us what a, what a transition bond is, then we have to define it. So the de definition is a lot less clear uh, when, when we put it this way without a qualifying asset. Because transition can be many things. Uh, you can be a renewable plant, you can be an EV, you can be a steel plant transitioning to a uh, cleaner structure. Uh, so uh, I, I think this is one of the major difficulties for us into getting more traction into the sector. So, so just to put it simply, I think it's an inevitability, but it's something that's going to take a little bit more time. That's why I asked the question to <laughs> HKMA, please. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, we would answer that by saying, transition to what? Yeah. Well, of course, it's a transition to 1.5. This is what the overarching target is now, which means this is a subset of our climate thinking. It's not a separate. Now, the qu how we do that and what, what is the right pathway, these are, of course, complex decisions to look at. But at least in terms of principles, as exemplified in the Japanese government's transition principles or the transition principles from many other agencies, 1.5 means you can slot it into your green portfolio because at the end of the day, it's just another complicated way of doing green. And this is quite important because we're wanting to build on a successful market, not try and create a new silo. Whether it's illiquidity issues and new fund mandates and so on, which make it complicated and make it slow because we've got to get that growth, growth that Shawnee was talking about earlier, if we're going to meet the challenges that we currently face. Well, that's my pitch to you anyway, Gabriel. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you have a look at the bonds as they come. We There's had also another question about humanizing the conversation mm. that yes. we all heartedly yeah, yeah, yeah. with you. Uh, when you look at how we as development banks report, you know, if you pick up our report on sustainable finance, it's not going to talk only about the, the yield on our bonds. It's going to talk about, you know, the offshore wind project in the Fujian province, how many uh, households benefit from renewable energy. Uh, I mean, it's literally codified in hardcore uh, metrics that is measurable, uh, linked to a sustainable development uh, goal. Uh, so I think well, that's one area where development banks have really sort of upped their game in standardizing the, the metrics and having common reporting metrics. In fact, it's now already five years old that MDBs have a joint report on uh, climate finance. The language, a common language has been uh, used and it is being defined in, in, in very uh, measurable uh, terms. And that's one of the features you're going to see in the next couple of years. A lot more discussion about just transition. And it's not just transition for people negatively impacted as we shift away from coal. It's just transition for those people who are suffering the impacts yeah. of climate change. There's going to be a lot of life-threatening circumstances coming through. We have to ensure that those people have a pathway too. So I'm going to say transition to resilience is going to become a theme in the coming year going forward, which will widen the whole thing. This is not about top-down. In China, it has been top-down because the regulators decide it's important. But in the rest of the world, this is about risk management. This is about, and especially in resilience, reducing the forward risk of default, as our friends the Bureau of International Settlements have been writing about. It's both because of the impacts of climate change and how it might affect portfolios or individual companies, and also the policy changes sweeping through the system and what that's gonna mean for the businesses. If you're an energy business and you are not across renewable energies and the extraordinary price reductions we're seeing, frankly, you're going to be out of business in 10 years. You're going to go the way of the dinosaurs. If you are a, a company that has made the transition, like Nextera in the US or Orsted in Denmark, who are now, have now, they was, two years ago, they overtook the market capitalization of BP and Exxon. They were coal companies that shifted to become renewable energy companies. 15 years ago. And this, that's, that's the future that you can see. So this is a risk of missing out and a risk of default when it comes to climate impact. So this should all just give Gabriel 
a much better risk profile for the bonds he's investing in. Right, Tracy? <laughs> I want to write on the social piece as well. So, of course, on just transition, uh, just transition, I think it's very well understood in that piece. But we have seen on the back of COVID, for good or for bad, actually a lot more uh, funding going to the social element for health and safety. Pharmaceutical has been picking it up in that, ele um, in that um, uh, perspective. But because all of you are all in Hong Kong, we should also share. In West Kowloon, so if you're new to Hong Kong, West Kowloon Central District is a cultural district, and they have multiple museums. Museum there. And then one of the um, um, sustainability link structure that um, I led, look at two social elements. One is look at how to um, um, encourage, encourage more underprivileged youth to attend the museum. So because museums is being perceived as a, you know, the prestige, high-end um, society, right? So one of that is tied to how do we uh, encourage more underprivileged youth to be in this culture center? So that's one target. And then Another one is accessibility. Accessibility, not just for disabled to access to the museum, but imagine if you're blind, you go and see a picture. The museum actually have to create a program to read it to you, to describe what that picture is like. So they have to develop multiple, lots of this program to drive that social elements. So just want to share that with you. It can be actually cut across a lot of um, the social area and um, want to bring this example to you close to home. We need to wrap up. We're at the end. I'm going to ask our panelists for a final word on the future and what does it look like. I'm going to start for, with Shawnee. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure. Uh, this, what, what? Maybe I'll just quote, you know, the conference <laughs> ready, set, transition. I think the private sector is ready and the rules are being set and being enhanced with uh, policies and incentives for Asia's transition. Beautifully put. Manchu, you just put out this report. What's the next look? What's it look like in the next year or two, the future? Certainly positive. And just look at the people. People make changes and people get together, discuss. The very action of so many people attending this conference is very promising. So, yeah, good. Gabriel. Sure, uh, to, to paraphrase the previous panelist, I think the future is exciting. Like, uh, so, so, so I think uh, this year has been uh, quite an interesting year for finance, especially for us investors, as well as last year, because uh, there's, for fixed income investors in particular, because there's been a huge shift in terms of the rate environment, uh, which uh, the bankers are probably familiar with, that has led to uh, quite a drastic change in terms of the issuance picture. So if you look at the, the net issuance of bonds this year, it's down year to date, it's down anywhere from 20, 30%. <laughs> so, uh, but if you look at the, the, the structure of that, uh, in, in terms of the percentage of sustainable bonds, it used to be around uh, 7 to 8%. Now it's around 14 to 15%. So sustainable bonds are still growing, even in a down market. Mm -hmm. So I think that points to, that says a lot about the market, which is that we're still seeing a very, very strong demand for it, like from our side, from other investors. Uh, and uh, like, even if you look at the greenium, like I mentioned earlier, we're still, we're still, still seeing the greenium there. And for example, if you, you take a look at a new development bank's bonds, green bond, which was issued, I think, was two months ago, you'll find it very hard, hard to source in the market. And uh, so I think the future for the green bond is very bright, and there's still a lot of demand for it. It's just which path we're, we're, we're going to take in the future. Leslie. Judging by the energy in this room and the tone you said right at the beginning, earlier on, uh, the future is indeed you know, electric and, and uh, very uh, exciting. I do want to make a punt uh, for uh, some of the top-down approaches and, and, and the value uh, in that, Sean, just to complement what you said earlier on. If I look at the um, uh, 2021 January, I think it was, with the Bank of England inserted, just with a simple clause, changing their mandate. It's one of the most independent central banks in the world adding net zero commitment in the mandate of the Monetary Policy Committee, that single action has now spurred and been a catalyst for other central banks throughout the world looking at similar measures. Now, just making a simple change, uh, probably of a sentence or two, even a couple of words, can have dramatic change in, in the industry. BIS uh, produced a book called Green Swan last year and also looking at the regulation of central banks and how they can be more impactful in sort of setting the overall rules. So I do want to sort of just uh, uh, amplify the point again that some 
you know, interventions that are systemic in, in, in character from a top-down perspective, we still need more of that to re-engineer the financial architecture as we know it. Tracy. Right. Um, I have four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, two things, two key things. So earlier I mentioned about the continued development in terms of sustainable finance product. That required to push all the way across the ecosystem. But one thing in this development, I think carbon market, is a key. It needs to happen and it needs to take the scale, so a key development in the carbon market. Secondly is technology, green tech. So may that be using fintech to really accelerate the way that we you know, structure sustainable finance product. Take sustainable trade as an example. How do you use technology to hit multiple layers, multiple tiers of um, financing, and then with an ESG rating angle tied to it, so that you can actually encourage all the supply chain to accelerate their greening. And, to, and the other one is also on the clean tech as well. Look at the pricing of sustainable aviation fuel, CCUS, they are just so expensive. So technology need to come in to really accelerate the development, bring it into market price, to conventions, price that at least be competitive, just like how solar has been developed on the you know, past 10 years. So I think technology and carbon market are the two key that I want to see. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for our sponsors, Standard Chartered, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, CCXI Green Finance, Myotech, and all the other supporters. Thank you for the speakers that have flown in from all corners of Asia to be part of Asia, well, all corners of the world, in fact. Megumi from Tokyo, for example. We have an enormous challenge. It's not just about changing energy, although that is, in some ways, the most urgent thing because you have to get emissions down. It's about changing industry. We need hydrogen to allow steel to change quickly, cheap hydrogen. We need buildings to change. You heard from Kerry at the Hong Kong Green Building Council earlier, 40% of the emissions reductions we have to achieve between now and 2050 are from the property sector. We've got to change a lot there. We need agricultural change. We also do need changes, as you heard earlier, in the global architecture of finance. It won't just be MDBs. It'll be how capital flows around the world. We're going to have a lot of crises from now on. It's going to be like this. There's going to be bad news every year somewhere in the world. There's going to be death rates going up, as already going up. We need to ensure that we work together. If we atomize into our different countries and just do what we want to do, and Tom, we're going to find ourselves, our neighbours are going to fall apart and people will be coming across the border. That's the message for Japan, Korea, China, Europe, and the US. We need to collaborate to ensure resilience in all the economies of the world. That is a just transition measure, but frankly, it's also a survival measure. We've got more chance of surviving working together than working separately. Now, what does that mean? Well, one thing it means is investment in the global architecture which will support resilience triple the budget of the World Health Organization so we can better deal with the pandemic next time. For example, we have a potential to start this process in the financial sector, the ISSB, the PRI, representing investors around the world, the various other measures to support global flows of capital, including international harmonization of taxonomy that's happening through the Common Ground Taxonomy. Look for ways to work together around the world because otherwise there is no future for us. And one thing we do need to have is a future for our children. Good news is the key performance indicator are green and transition deals. We can all do that. And we can all make this a viable, profitable way forward. So please, 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 please <laughs> find me some deals. Make sure the numbers grow. Thank you so much for being here today. Please, a clap for our fantastic audience. I hope you'll be able to join us for a short while to celebrate this gathering of advocates. Thanks for hanging about. Thank you.